I'm guessing I'm not the first person to tell you that the world is burning. The, the Earth is warming. And it's bad, you guys. David Wallace Wells opens his book The Uninhabitable Earth by writing, It is worse. Much worse than you think. And I haven't even finished reading this book. I read that one sentence, took a panic nap, and can't bring myself to read any more. It seems like everything we do is making the situation worse. Driving, flying, turning the lights on, heating the house, cooling the house, I don't know, sitting in the house. And that's what makes it tricky. It's all that stuff that's so nice and convenient and comfortable that's causing problems. And it's also that when I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about breakfast and the work I have to do that day. Not the cosmic scope of seven billion people's fate on a giant planet that's getting hotter. So what can we do? What does social science have to say about letting people know about climate change and shaping their behavior? The good news is that there are people working on these problems. You're listening to Opinion Science, the show about our opinions, where they come from, and how they change. I'm Andy Luttrell, and today I talk to Matt Goldberg. He's a postdoctoral associate, soon to be associate research scientist, at the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And this program is pretty cool. Here's what they say on their website. We are social scientists studying the causes and consequences of public opinion and behavior. Our mission is to advance the science of climate change communication, help leaders communicate more effectively, and increase the public's understanding of climate risks and opportunities. Sounds great. I talk with Matt about the climate change communication program, his research, and the insights we can take away for changing this insane predicament our planet is in. So, thanks for doing this. Uh, I just kind of want to spend some time getting to know the the work that you do and and uh, uh, the work even that your group does at the Climate Change Communication. Is it a center? Is it a department? What kind yeah, of? Yeah, it's uh, called the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. We're a research center, so we're we're in the what's becoming the School of the Environment. They're renaming it uh, in a few months. Hmm. And um, we're not uh, an academic department, uh, so we we function uh, a bit independently. And uh, most of the people that work there are um, almost entirely research focused. Gotcha. So how, how, how big of a group is it? Uh, so we're, it depends on uh, uh, who, we, who we count as part of the group because we have a lot of partners we're extending uh, all across the world now. Um, but in-house we have, um, so there are three, three or four, uh, research scientists, uh, and a lot of us wear many hats. Um, right now we have four postdocs, um, as you might've heard on Twitter, I'm moving into the position of associate research scientist. Uh, so very exciting, uh, news. And we also have a, a big student team. So that could be 20 to 30 students at a time working on social media stuff, blog posts, and, and all that. We also have data scientists. Uh, so a pretty, a, a pretty big, diverse group. Is it a pretty collaborative team? There's sort of a cool, I was just poking around the website earlier. It seems like there's a cool centralized uh, spot for all the work that's coming out of this place to, to, to find it. And it, does it seem like this is like a team effort or is it just happen to be a, a place where lots of people who are like-minded come together? Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a team effort and uh, we get a lot of good exposure to each other's expertise. We have geographers, sociologists, political scientists, social, uh, social psychologists. So I've got a lot of good exposure to, uh, different fields and approaches. And, um, yeah, often we are jumping into, so there'll often be leads for specific projects on like, so we have the Yale Climate Opinion Maps uh, uh, run by uh, Jen Marlin, who's a geographer by training, but then she'll help with my stuff and I'll help with her stuff. So there's a lot of crossover and I, I think that's uh, often really productive for our creativity. Cool. Is there a sp an example that comes to mind of, of where that cross disciplinary collaboration comes into play. So like where geographers and big data people and psychologists would, would come together to answer the same kind of question. Absolutely. Uh, one example was, um, so in 2014, long before I, I joined 
the research center, they, they did a project on hurricane evacuation decisions and they collected a representative sample of Connecticut coastal residents. Uh, so that was collected uh, and led by Jen Marlin, who's a geographer. And um, I saw the data were there and there were some variables that um, I had been thinking about, uh, and I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, um, relating to the metacognitive model. Uh, so I was just thinking about uh, what predicts uh, decisions to evacuate in a hurricane. And uh, they weren't thinking as much about uh, like confidence in past decisions and stuff like that. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities where I see that we already have the data in hand, but I'm looking at it from a different perspective and seeing uh, some variables as more valuable than uh, someone coming from a different uh, field might. So yeah, so what I came across that earlier today, the uh, metacognitions as a predictor of um, evacuation mm -hmm. decisions. So was this like survey data on on people reflecting, or or what? What was the what was this project exactly? So um, this was so this is feeding into what is now a segmentation analysis, trying to understand like who the people are that are first out versus people that think that they're highly prepared and they're willing to stick it out regardless of the intensity of the storm. Um, but I I saw those data as opportunity to look at attitudes. Um, so we asked about um, past hurricane evacuation decisions uh, in Hurricane Sandy. And uh, it was the literature was kind of ambiguous as to whether past decisions to evacuate predicted intentions to evacuate in the future. And it, it largely didn't our data, but it was pretty weak. Um, and I brought the idea of um, like reflections on that past decision. So if you if you evacuated in the past, but you thought it was unnecessary, or you're not confident that you made the right decision, then that past behavior isn't going to be a great predictor of your intentions to do so in the future. And uh, we found that that confidence in that past de decision uh, what made the predictive power of that past behavior uh, significantly stronger. There's, it reminds me, I mean, there are models of predicting behavior where there's, it seems like so often one of the biggest predictors is your past behavior yeah. right, across all sorts of domains. But this is a nice example of your past behavior isn't always, mm -hmm. or isn't always treated as the basis for the next decision, yeah. especially if you're not confident. Have you thought about, I mean, in the midst of all this social distancing and reactions to coronavirus, it sure seems like we have the makings of that again, mm -hmm. right? Where people who go, I I might have stayed home before, but I wasn't sure that that was the right thing to do. If something like this comes up again, is the concern based on your data that that these are the folks who are going to say, forget it, I don't care what you're saying, I'm going out? Absolutely. And uh, so our team is now dedicating a lot of our time to understanding uh, best predictors of behaviors around the, the co coronavirus pandemic. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been getting kind of worried as I scroll through through Twitter, people saying things so like kind of emblematic of this kind of situation where people took all the right precautions, but then were still infected, that could lower efficacy for these mitigated behaviors. Because if you think no matter what you do, it's, it's bound to happen, um, then I don't see people wanting to take those precautions. Let's let's backpedal a little bit and just get a sense of how you came to to this area. Was was public science communication, climate change communication, the thing that got you into social science to begin with, or did this sort of become in a circuitous way where you ended up? Yeah, it kind of happened. So I was always interested in it, but I, my research wasn't directly dedicated to it. Of course, I always thought about the so what question regarding my research. Why does it matter? Um, but I was pretty strongly in the basic research camp, um, coming from a background in social psych and a lot of people around me doing, uh, taking that similar approach. So um, I had a, like a attitudes and persuasion background. And I was mostly interested in, as I was uh, headed towards the end of my grad career, I was thinking a lot about how people defend their beliefs. So how do people justify what they believe even in the face of very strong evidence and what methods do they use? Do they counter argue? Do they attack the source? Stuff like that. And um, so I was thinking about how to apply that. And I, I happened to land this position in which case I was able to dedicate my uh, research time all to uh, the important issue of climate change. I've still been thinking a lot about other issues now, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus, um, but it was a nice bridge. So it kind of happened 
uh, serendipitously where I was, uh, I had the, that background that was very applicable to uh, science communication. And now I'm just getting more ingrained into that world now over the past couple of years. So you hadn't been doing anything on climate change specifically before you started in this No, department? it was often a, a issue in one of the studies, but it was one of mm -hmm. several issues where I was studying some phenomenon rather than starting with the problem of how do we best communicate this? How do we engage people? How do we convince people? Uh, so I was focused more on the basic question. And now I'm thinking about more of like, well, how do we take our findings and scale them up to a nationwide or worldwide level? And uh, I wasn't really thinking about the practical imp implications as deeply as I am now. So it, what do you see as the differences in approach? So this is, I'm always curious. So uh, the, the camp of folks who tries to build theories about how persuasion works and how people form their opinions versus a world that's very specifically interested in a particular outcome and how to communicate certain kinds of information. Have you noticed differences in how people approach similar questions when they're coming at it from those different perspectives? Yeah, I think one of those, one of the techniques that has kind of tipped me in that, in the applied direction is segmentation analysis. Because when you do a, a study and let's say you're trying to get uh, a sample as representative as possible, uh, that can tell you a lot about the overall effect in that population. But often we're focusing on local issues. So, um, you know, if you live in Florida, you might be more worried about hurricanes or heat waves and stuff like that. So in thinking about the context, uh, we often find that that's incredibly important in what people's mayors are doing or uh, the local issues they face with water or air pollution, stuff like that. And often that we weren't thinking about those, I wasn't thinking about those issues as much uh, when I was just doing basic science and, and thinking, well, if, if my sample is good enough, then um, it'll, an it'll help me answer my questions. And when we're problem focused on how do we best communicate this issue, uh, we're able to strategize a little bit better on uh, the contextual factors that come into play. So when you say segmentation analysis, I'm not super familiar with that. Does that just mean l kind of splitting apart the data into different focus areas and then probing those more closely, or, or, or that's just what I'm guessing based on based on what exactly. You just said? It's so there are a number of ways to do it, but it's basically trying to understand the clusters in the public. So in our case, the American public. So we uh, our well known segmentation analyses are the global warming six Americas. And uh, basically we use a bunch of different inputs, including people's attitudes and risk perceptions about climate change. And we're able to group them uh, into clusters where they're very like uh, people in that cluster, but very different from people outside the cluster. Uh, for example, so someone who doesn't believe climate change is happening could either be disengaged, they just don't pay attention to it, or they could be far uh, certain on the other side where they're highly engaged except they're um, they're dismissive of the issue. So those are examples of two different uh, segments in the American population that we treat very differently in terms of our strategy. Um, and we're trying to apply that now to perceptions of clean energy. There are some people that are more preoccupied with the costs of it. And then there are other people that just simply don't know that fossil fuels are harmful. Uh, and those, even though th they could look very similar on uh, one or two indicators, uh, when we look at the clusters, we're able to better identify one, how, how big of, of an audience is this? Like if 20% of the country uh, is, doesn't know uh, that fossil fuels are harmful, for example, then we can try and pinpoint that geographically. What, what then are some of the strategies that come out? Once, once you have these mm -hmm. segments identified, what then, it, what, what becomes the next step? Obviously, you tailoring strategies to them, it sounds like. But in a in a targeted way, do you have to create six different messages for how to change behavior for all different clusters, or is there some sort of consolidation that you can do? Yeah, I've been kind of I've been updating my views on this uh, as as we gain more evidence. So I think the tailoring of messaging is is definitely very important, especially over time when you're just hit with repeated messages to the point that people are internalizing. Uh, some like underlying theme like freedom or um, I've been thinking more about like leaving a place better than you found it uh, kind of themes. Um, but so I, I think that tailoring is important, but I don't think it's as important as just the raw signal of like hearing enough 
of a particular mm. kind of message uh, uh, than another kind of message. Um, because a, a lot of the, the background in social psych on motivated reasoning and, and other approaches suggests that we have no hope in, in communicating these issues to people that are highly dismissive of the issue. But I've, I've largely been surprised that they, they kind of update like a Bayesian kind of style where it's just like the more they hear about a particular narrative, the more they come to believe as long as it's plausibly within the, the realm of, of their views. I came across this study a few weeks ago, and then it became this, uh, I have this blog on psychology today on public opinion mm -hmm. stuff. And so it sort of spun out into this idea because it was this, it, like no one has cited it. There's been like mm -hmm. 20 citations and it came out in the 70s, uh -huh. but they looked at um, when seatbelts were mandated mm -hmm. in Sweden, I think. And they saw public opinion was like totally anti seatbelts before people said this is uncomfortable and I don't buy that it's actually going to help anything. But then the government said, sorry, all you got to wear your seatbelts now. And sometimes sometime in I think like 72 or something, mm -hmm. 1972 or three. And then the following year, they have another national representative sample. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden people are like, oh yeah, seatbelts seem like they're good at protecting people and like they're not that uncomfortable. And so to, to your point, it just is reminding me of this thing of like, yeah, you might have opposition to something, but once it becomes normalized and a particular message becomes more familiar, yeah, you may end up seeing more widespread yeah, we're uh, even, appreciation. We're even that. seeing that with gay marriage. I saw a paper on that where there was very strong opposition, and there still is to some extent, but um, public opinion has shifted so dramatically on that issue, uh, like around 2012, uh, when it was passed. And uh, I've been continuously surprised by it. Now it's increasingly not surprising because I'm now moved over in, into that direction in our understanding. Yeah. And I wonder, it reminded me of climate change related policy, because if you just start, a, start making new rules and saying, hey, this is where our energy is going to come from. This is what you got to do. You'll get tax breaks if you do this and that. You could it's interesting from a persuasion angle because we're often so interested in saying what are the messages that change opinions mm -hmm. versus what changes can we make in the world that will change opinions mm -hmm. right? or how can we make the, make something the new normal mm -hmm. yeah exactly and i've been thinking a lot about our broad strategy as to whether how much of this should be top down versus bottom up and uh, that's been influencing a lot of my recent ideas about like sometimes it's just seeing others around you and that's a lot of that's just classic social psych but um sometimes we underestimate how powerful that can be you had a, a paper uh, maybe last year on consensus uh -huh. related stuff this sort of reminds me of this could you walk us through what what you found there what the goals were for that yeah so there are a couple so we there is one where we focus on scientific consensus and i'm also i'm working on another one now uh, but then there's a, another one on social consensus and this has kind of been tough uh, methodologically to think about because well so there are in thinking about it experimentally um so we just looked at uh, perceived social consensus in people's close social networks so among friends and family and a lot of the research on climate change communication is focused on reference groups that I find that people don't really care that much about what are other Americans think? What do people in your state think? And experimentally, it's, it's easy to manipulate, um, uh, depending on, on the area, whether you're, you're tied to, uh, telling participants the true public opinion, uh, and you can't really manipulate people's friends and family's views. So it's, it's really challenging, but we, we at least tried to estimate what that causal effect would be, uh, with, uh, with correlational data. And, we were looking at uh, whether norms are more influential to uh, conservatives uh, than liberals. And we found that the evidence was strongly pointing in that direction. Of course, there are a lot of limitations to um, uh, in our ability to conclude that. Um, but in terms of the public opinion numbers, people who believe their friends and family care about the issue and want them to care about the issue, uh, the public opinion numbers are so dramatic as to to raise alarm bells as to why we're not uh, dedicating more resources to um, a messaging about norms. Uh, so I I found that that was a more plausible explanation that norms are influential rather than people are projecting what they believe onto close others. So you're saying so so friends to the extent that friends and family mm -hmm. believe in climate change and yeah. want to make 
uh, climate change related changes in the world, mm -hmm. an individual, him or herself, also then becomes much more likely to yeah, subscribe exactly. to those ideas. And, yeah. and there's also this gap as well where uh, a large majority of Americans uh, say that climate change is personally important to them as an issue, but also majority don't talk about it to their friends and family. So that's one hmm. thing that we've been thinking about and trying to close that gap because some of it's kind of like a pluralistic ignorance effect where people think that uh, there are deniers everywhere, but they're under 10% uh, that are just very dismissive and uh, like strongly opposed to uh, climate legislation. Hmm. So it's, it's, it has to be driven by perceived consensus, right? And, and probably that's what you're measuring, right? How much do I think my friends and family have these thoughts? And hopefully most of the time that is on the money, but yeah, uh, maybe sometimes if I just am believing that I'm in a world where everyone is denying this stuff, even if that's false, it may chip away at my confidence. Too. Absolutely. So we've been thinking a lot about how to take a bottom up approach experimentally and trying to recruit. And this is where the segmentation comes in. The most engaged segment is the alarmed where they... They know it's happening. They know it's human caused. They're worried about it. They're ready to take action. And that's almost a third of Americans that are in that camp now. But a lot of them are, they don't know what, what to do. Um, and also they're in a particularly powerful position to talk to people around them that might not really be engaged with the issue. So we've been thinking about recruiting a large sample of, of alarmed Americans and having them pull in uh, a, a close friend or family member to talk about the issue. And um, it's it's kind of tricky logistically, but uh, we're trying to work on it and trying to think of more bottom-up approaches. The thought being that just by encouraging people to talk about it mm -hmm. will shape perceived consensus of other people. Exactly. To remind them like, oh, the, the majority opinion is not of denial. The majority opinion is of, uh, maybe not majority, but you yeah. said a third, but-, but yeah. Majority are subscribing to this is a problem, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And a third is like alarmed and like ready to ready to go. Yeah, there seems like there's a, a lack of work in persuasion over the years on that getting people to persuade others mm -hmm. part. Or like, what are those? I mean, you, you're seeing more of it now, but it would be an interesting place to go with this, right? To say, how do we encourage people who are alarmed or even who are sort yeah. of quietly concerned to start talking about it and change the perception. Yeah. And, and thinking about this, I actually dug up some some older social psych papers on attitude alignment. So like if um, like a couple disagrees on an issue, uh, does one go to the other or does the other, go, you know, start moving their attitude towards their spouse? Mm. And uh, one of the key points that they make is the ideal scenario of attitude alignment is where it's the issue is central to one and peripheral to the other. And uh, then in which case, the one for whom it's peripheral will move to the one it's central. And so I'm thinking about using that, that framework for you, taking alarmed folks on climate change and having them choose someone for whom the issue isn't as important, and they should be more malleable and a, a lot of work by, uh, by you and, and uh, um, and people coming from this uh, classic attitudes and persuasion camp uh, would show that people that are more malleable when they're just not as engaged with the issue. It, it almost makes me think if there's like a heuristic of, well, if it's that important to you, right? You hear that kind of language. People use that. Well, if it's that important to you, then fine. I'll, I'll change my behavior. Yeah. And it seems like that's that's what you're getting at here is just people who go, I could, it doesn't bother me to believe this. And so I'm happy to just you care that much, I'll do it. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Politically, there's a stereotype, I think, that there's a pretty steep political, like ideological difference in uh, belief in climate change and uh, concern for mitigating its effects. But it strikes me that this may be one of those cases where cons perceived consensus doesn't match the actual public opinion. Do you get the sense that there is as deep an ideological divide yeah. in commitment to these issues or if it's more of a stereotype? Um, yeah, so I think so there's both true, a true ideological divide and people are overestimating it. Uh, so a lot of liberals uh, and Democrats don't expect that half of Republicans are pretty good on this issue. Um, and Republicans think that a lot of people, a lot of fellow Republicans are not as good on the issue. So there are, there are a few 
places to build bridges there that I think uh, that I think we need to take more advantage of. Yeah, it's sort of. I was thinking of. I feel like there's data on college students and drinking behavior. Mm-hmm. That there's this there's this perception that all college students are heavy drinkers. Yeah, and so. The reality is that that's not the case. That yes, there's like a, a vocal few, <laughs> a segment of college student population that are heavy drinkers. Um, but people then just have this perception that like, oh, well, if that's what everyone's doing, then I have to do it. And that's going to change the way I approach it. It made me think that that maybe some of the political divide is like that, kind of like you were saying, where I'm assuming all of these Republicans are against these measures and all Democrats are in favor of them. But that may be a distorted image that that's changing the way people are willing to engage with other people. And really where I was going with this was that more liberal minded folks may avoid talking about this with more conservative minded folks because of this stereotype, when in actuality, that conversation might go more pleasantly than they assume. Yeah, exactly. I, I find that anecdotally and also supporting in our in our data that, yeah, especially when you come at it in a way that well, one avoids a lot of buzzwords or just go go right to the solution. So interestingly, we find that a lot of a lot of people on the right don't accept that this is an is- a serious issue, but they support a lot of the solutions. They don't want to rely on on uh, dirty fossil fuels or they they care that uh, air pollution affects people and they're willing to support a lot of these policies that, are directly addressing the issue of climate change, like moving to clean renewable energy. So you could come at it in in a way that that's easy for them to agree with. In the the Center for Climate Change Communication, have you seen the application part start to happen? Like how how much is our people's work kind of internal building a sense of the issue versus going out there and, and talking about this with policymakers and media and, and those sorts of outlets? I think that we're having a, an impact. It's hard to to get a sense of it on the grand scale because especially because large media, um, they, they're they able to have such a strong signal that it's really hard to pull apart like how big of a difference our strategies are making. Um, but when we take our our approaches out of the lab into the field, we do find that that they end up working successfully using just a lot of what we've already known from uh, communication and social psychology. Uh, one example is, so this is not published yet, we're still talking about um, how to build on it, is that we use this uh, campaign called New Climate Voices. And basically we, we developed a set of videos that had climate or had um, like center right friendly messengers. So we had a military general, we had a evangelical Christian uh, climate scientist and um, also a former Republican congressman. And uh, we we targeted two congressional districts that were considered purple, so a mix of Republicans and Democrats. And um, we ran ads on Facebook and YouTube for a period of six weeks. And we found that public opinion numbers were shifting as high as you know, nine or 10 percentage points on belief that it's happening and human caused and worry about the issue. So we find that using these principles uh, out in the field uh, really could make a difference. Wait, where, where are these public opinion numbers coming from? Independent polls? Uh, so we would uh, we surveyed before and after. Uh, well, so we we randomized on the I think the district level or the zip code level. Uh, so we weren't able to get pre posts like within within subjects, but um, in sampling the same area again, we saw uh, increases in in belief about climate change. No, these are these are um, people who you don't know if they saw the YouTube ads. Oh, we you do know. know that these we do know. On. Yeah, okay. there's like Got an it. online identifier for them. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So you're able to to ask uh, opinions of people who are engaging with that message. Yeah, mm-hmm, exactly. And I thought somehow you were getting sort of whole wide swaths of people <laughs> community wide changing because of that. That would have been really impressive. Yeah. If the- <laughs> I hope to move in that direction in the next few years. We, we've been thinking about that, like, how could you, uh, you know, because I've been thinking about diversity of approach. Uh, I think we focus too much on mass communication, but I'm thinking, if you're hearing it in the media, people are talking to you about it. There are people in the streets. Like they're, I'm thinking about like the diversity and approach. Does that make it stick a bit better? And um, that would, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can build 
our strategy to the point where we can see uh, like congressional district level change at, at that uh, at that level. It would be, I, that would be that's the goal, I'd say. How close do you think like on the ground communication people like people who are advocates for climate change related policy, people who are making decisions or trying to inform the public? How much do you see those groups relying on and leaning on the social science versus kind of throwing darts at the board and seeing what sticks? I think there's a, a nice mix. It, it's hard because I don't there. I'm sure there are many organizations that, that I'm not aware of, but um, we so and that's kind of we've been thinking a lot about that. And uh, so we have a partnerships program. So where we where we advise or uh, share insights with these organizations so they can stay close to like what has strongly backed by evidence. Um, but I'm sure that there's a fair share of um, organizations that are uh, informing their insights based on just uh, either just like a, a couple focus groups or their own intuition. Um, but I think that there's increasingly a need and also um, this well is increasingly uh, demand uh, for social science research. So I'm very grateful for that in terms of like feeling that our field is appreciated and valued, um, but also uh, we're able to work way more efficiently of just uh, creating tools that advocates can just deploy right to the public or to influence uh, legislators and their staff. That's great. So what then are the the remaining challenges? I think it sounds like we haven't nailed it all yet, right? Because yeah. we're still <laughs> we're still swimming upstream and pushing against uh, lots of change. So what's on the horizon that social scientists scientists broadly are are needing to be on the front lines to figure out? Yeah, I think so. Well, one is just like a systemic issue of we certainly we don't have near the money that the opposition has. Uh, so that I think in terms of just raw signal, uh, there's no amount of intelligence that can overcome just dominating the narrative. Uh, and that's that's a big problem. But in terms of the the unknowns that that we're working on and thinking about of informing strategy in, in the broader sense is I'd say the biggest question is probably what sticks um, a lot of there's a lot of disincentive to um, for scientists to do work that takes very long because of publication pressures. Uh, so we're not as motivated. Well, you have the, the motivation to do it, but also the resources, it costs way more uh, to track people over a long time. Um, but I, I just, I'm working on a perspective piece now and trying to lay out like, what are the big unknowns for us to tackle? And, and I'd say that's, that's the biggest one. And uh, what messages stick? But also, how do people internalize some of these things we already know works, like messages from credible sources that are simple and repeated often, um, internalizing of, of norms. And I'm, I'm suggesting that this like bottom up approach uh, should help with that, uh, because friends and family are often the most credible and influential messengers. Um, so in thinking about the long game is something we need to pay a little bit more attention to, because I think I kind of had this this bias as well coming into this field where I was like, how do I craft the perfect way of saying this? And then they'll get it. Um, but it's really, I've, I've been trying to focus more on uh, like internalizing norms. Like there are some of these things that are so easy to agree with that they're not mm -hmm. even part of the strategy uh, where it's just like, we should leave the place better than we found it, right? We shouldn't trash our environment or our water and our air, right? Like any anyone could agree to that, but we're not using it as like a foundation for our messaging as much. Uh, so I think in thinking about the long game, there are a lot of open questions to think about. Well, great. Well, we'll look forward to seeing all those answers revealed <laughs> in the in the coming months and years, I'm sure. So Absolutely. thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk about this stuff. Uh, if people want to know more about the kinds of research that you're doing, where could they find you? Uh, you could find my updates on Twitter at MattGoldberg100 or um, on my website, uh, MattGoldberg100.com. Uh, or you could go to our website to find um, our team's work that's coming out. Uh, so that's it. Um, so you could look up the Yale program on climate change communication. We have reports coming out all the time. Uh, so, and a lot of tools for educators and advocates that I encourage you to look at. Nice. I, I did have one question about your website. It's called, it's Mackelberg 100. 
Yeah. What's the 100? <laughs> there are so many Matt Goldbergs. <laughs> and I didn't want to just take the next number in line. And I thought 100 was a strong number. So uh, that's been, that's my Gmail. It's my website. It's my handle. I figure that I'd, I might as well jump on a, on a good number rather than being Matt Goldberg 6 or something. Right. Yeah. I wondered if, if 100 was next in line or you really, it sounds like you were, you were intentional about it. So. For sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mac Wahlberg 100. Yep. Mr. 100. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you again for being here. Thank you for inviting me. That'll do it for this episode of Opinion Science. Thanks to Matt for coming on. To learn more about his work, check out the show notes for a link to his website, mattgoldberg100.com. For more on this show, visit opinionsciencepodcast.com or follow us at OpinionSciPod on Twitter or Facebook uh, to learn more about things coming out. Uh, and this is a very new show, so if you like this, you like what we're doing, uh, please go ahead and take a couple seconds to review us on Apple Podcasts, share this on social media. Uh, it'll really help get the word out. But uh, that's all I have to say, so thanks for being here and uh, see you next time. <laughs>